I went to school, the teacher that I had was, he was really big on sort of having the right atmosphere to work in. Mm -hmm. You know, really try to have a, an atmosphere that just makes me feel really comfortable. You know, I just kind of try to keep everything where I can just get to it right away. You know, I'm working on something here and, uh, and I want to, you know, record my out-of-tune zither, then it's pretty, pretty quick to just set that up and record it. This over here, these are all my, my amps from playing live music. This is my main live uh, Mesa Boogie that I play my violin through. And this is my big, my big rig. Back when we were working on um, Force Commander, uh, we, played, we did a heavy metal version of, uh, of the Imperial March and played it through that rig there. And this is my beloved electric violin. It was uh, handmade by a guy in upstate New York named Eric Aceto. And he carved this bear with little bone teeth. This is a, um, a salmon that he inlaid into the neck. That's my, that's my daughter when she was younger. And uh, it's uh, semi-hollow, so you actually get the sound of vibrating wood, which I really like a lot. It has five strings, so it has a it has an extra low string on it, so it's a viola and a violin in one. That's why I can get all these nice low sounds out of it, which I really uh, like for this sort of. And that low C just it just makes it into a whole different instrument. Because a normal violin, I mean, it's just you know. You're usually playing in this register, mm -hmm. and I just really like being able to get. go up high it makes this look special. Mm -hmm. uh, gives me more range on the instrument. Um, this is the first guitar that I really loved. I, um, I, I bought it with money I made uh, driving computer programs back and forth between Trenton and Philadelphia. And back in the days when, when uh, you know, computers were mainframes and, and you sat at a terminal and keyed in a bunch of things that then were printed into cards and then fed cards into a card reader. The printouts were actually useful things and also there wasn't anything like um, the internet. It was actually a, a viable job to, dry, to, to um, drive computer printouts from Trenton, New Jersey to Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And that was my job. This gash here, I still remember when I put that in there. You'd think it'd be something like really cool, like some bender or something like that, or you know, Keith Richards picked it up or something and dropped it or something, but it wasn't anything like that. I just let my, my chair hit it. <laughs> Wonderful Gibson from the 70s. I do most of my recording on it. You know, I really try to keep only the stuff that I um, use reasonably often. This over here is my collection of ethnic instruments. I've got this nice flute here. I'm a terrible flautist. Anyway, um, some nice percussion instruments. This is the the bell I used to record the, the harbor sound in Grim Fandango. Always have a kazoo. A kazoo is a good thing to have. <laughs> You'd be surprised how uh, little sounds of different kinds really come in handy in a score. This is a score from Casablanca that I got from a place in Hollywood that keeps all these classic movie scores. Um, I used this uh, uh, a little bit on Grim Fandango. So I like to have things around that are like um, literature, you might say. Keep most of my scores over here in, uh, in this cabinet. Uh, 
my my raw materials. I'm like this is uh, this is wonderful. This is Duke Ellington's in a mel mellow tone. Totally looking at that all the time during Grimm and also some more recent projects that I've done. These are some of my like handwritten stuff. These are some themes from Psychonauts. Written music is a beautiful thing, and, and what, what it allows you to do is kind of see everything at a glance and get a sense of, you know, how it all kind of fits together. So, you know, if you're used to reading music, you can look at it and go, oh yeah, that's that thing. Oh, and that sort of relates to that thing over there. So here's um, Black Velvetopia from Psychonauts. And, and uh, geez, I don't even know what that thing is, but... Um, and there's Sasha's Cube, which was like the only piece of 12-tone music I ever wrote. That's for composers out there, that's an arcane style of composing that's very dissonant. If something has some complex voicing, I'm, to really work it out, it helps to use paper. I grew up actually in, as a uh, very early years, I grew up in Switzerland. And so um, my first memories of music are Mozart and Sons of the Pioneers. Do you know who Sons of the Pioneers are? From the 30s to the 50s, they were the ones who did things like, you know, do not forsake me, oh my darling, or the tumbling tumbleweed, or cool clear water, all, anything you think of as a cowboy song was recorded by the Sons of the Pioneers, and my dad had a Sons of the Pioneers tape. So I had this sense of being, first of all, I had the sense of that I was not Swiss, and yet I loved the music that was around me, but I also loved this other music. And so I've, you know, a lot of people say when they, they say, oh man, I'm into all kinds of music. And what they mean is all kinds of music, everything from ACDC to Led Zeppelin, that's what they mean. Which is cool. Um, those are great bands. But when I say I'm into all kinds of music, I really mean all kinds of music. <laughs> that's been, for me, a great thing as a composer because um, with games, and especially, you know, with Tim's games, they're so rich in terms of their influences that I get to have fun with all the things that I you know, grew up with or have liked over the years. Before I had my conversion experience in school, um, I thought I would, would have wanted to be a physicist. I ran into two problems. One was that I wasn't laughing at the physics jokes. That was probably the biggest one. But I really kind of had this, this moment uh, in electronics class where I was like, you know, I just, I'm not excited enough about what, what, how this circuit works um, and that I really should be more excited about this. So I kind of wandered around Harvard Square and just had one of those moments where, you know what, I think I need to be doing music. I've always loved it. And uh, one of my housemates in Boston was Michael Land, and he later became the sound director at Lucas. Mm -hmm. I saved up some money and, and quit my job at Lexicon and drove out west, and the idea was to, um, you know, start a band. Mm -hmm. Well, by the time I got here, <laughs> he had gotten his job at LucasArts and said, oh, you know, you got to check this out. I got involved in that, and um, first as a consultant, and then, uh, and then you know, I joined the sound department and uh, so when I came to LucasArts half of my job was designing that system that played the music mm -hmm. and the other half was um, composing and what I just found is just like there like, as before I just gravitated towards doing the music. Um, I'm really glad that I have that because I just find um, that sort of a certain technical knowledge of classical music really, really helps when you're scoring games. Mm -hmm. It was either that summer or the following summer uh, the DX7 came out. So there, that was the beginning of this of the digital re revolution in, in music gear. But games were just starting in, in, in the late 80s, early 90s. They were just starting to really get interesting. Oh wow, there's like this, what, this an 8-bit speaker? What's this, you know? FM sound card? My goodness, we're going to play, make music on this? You know, after playing all these synthesized sounds, uh, when you had the opportunity to do live players and everybody goes, wow, you know, that sounds great. I mean, first time I heard uh, Rebel Assault, this is way, going way back, and what a uh, wonderful game that Vince Lee programmed. And, uh, you know, we're like, is this really going to work? I mean, how is he going to get the, all this off a of CD and so on? And when we heard like 8-bit mono John Williams play and saw a pixelated, uh, uh, you know, TIE fighter for the first time, we're like, oh no, this is, this is a watershed, this is huge, you know. And I still remember when the Sound Blaster came out 
and we, you know, could do a few little words on Monkey Island too, like, hey, quit it. You know, I think that was Largo. Wow, things are, games are going to be able to talk, you know, and this is going to be just like a movie. So, so we came in just at that time. I think I was just sort of really lucky to be in the middle of a lot of those things that were happening. Try to think about my roots when I'm doing stuff now. Like for Broken Age, I'm really trying to capture as much as I can of, of the vibe of music from, from games like Grim Fandango. And, you know, it's kind of like what I wish I could have done then, I can, I can now do. So I've set up a sample and hold loop by, by plucking uh, into, by plucking the violin. It's going through this uh, old lexicon prime time, which, I've, which is now sampling and holding that sound and making a repeating echo out of it. And I sort of like this kind of heartbeat thing that's going on. And I've pitched it down by an octave by messing with the... This was the original sound. I don't know if that's what we'll use for that scene, but it might be something like that. And um, it was a little bit more of an example of what I might do rather than what it really is. Mm -hmm. I did like the ba bump ba bump ba bump thing. Mm -hmm. This is a big, important scene in the game. I'm not going to talk about why it's important, but it's important. And um, it needs to have a big sound. I'll play another piece that's a little bit more finished that has some of the qualities that I like that I wanted to bring to this piece. Now what I did with this that big low sound is actually is actually um, the violin pitched way down a bunch of a bunch of times so it's like a chorus of violins pitched pitched down in different ways using um, using a different kind of pitch shift algorithms that Pro Tools has and um, what I like about this is that it's just very it's simple it's very sort of big it's slightly menacing what I like about that um, is the feeling of spaciousness the organic feeling that the violin brings to it, um, the sort of grandness of the French horn, that was very much came out of being able to actually put it in, see what was working, and then redo it to really get it to fit the emotion of that moment. It helps to be involved in the actual technical aspect of things. It brings me closer to the, to the actual experience of hearing the music in the game. So not just throwing the the music over the wall and hoping that it gets put in okay and then checking it out later. Um, I do first and foremost think of myself as a musician, but, but it's nice to be able to sort of um, get your own music into the, into the game technically as well.